to be introducing Dr. Ellen Offer, who's going to be presenting today as part of the Create. We'll even get that was exciting. The crowd for you. <laughs> uh, we're very excited that Dr. Usher was able to come today to talk to us about her research on supporting self-efficacy development in engineering. Dr. Usher is the children endowed. I have no idea. Children. Thank you. Um, endowed <laughs> professor and chair of the educational psychology program at the University of Kentucky. Her research focuses on the sources and effects of beliefs of personal efficacy in diverse contexts. Dr. Usher is regarded as one of the top scholars in the study of competence beliefs. Indeed, she authored the chapter on the topic for the most recent Handbook of Educational Psychology. Ellen has published in some of the most prestig prestigious journals in our field, including the Journal of Educational Psychology, Contemporary Educational Psychology, and Educational Psychologist, to name a few. And for those of you in engineering, <laughs> she's also published in the Journal of Engineering Education. Beyond her scholarship, Dr. Usher is known as a strong leader and outstanding mentor. For instance, she is currently the associate editor for the British Journal of Educational Psychology, and she previously served as the chair of the Motivation and Education SIG at AERA. She has received numerous awards for teaching and mentoring and is often sought out as a faculty mentor for mentoring programs at national conferences. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ellen Usher to MSU. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And I just want to thank um, all of you for hosting me. Um, it's been a wonderful morning so far. And a special thanks to Lagita for um, all of the organizational um, aspects of my visit. I really appreciate it. Um, I really like Michigan State so far. So yeah. <laughs> I haven't even been here 24 hours. So I know that some people will have to leave um, for class. And I appreciate Dr. Gray for letting his students stay a little bit into class today. I hope it's worth it. And I won't cry when the whole exodus happens in a few minutes. <laughs> you know, I started, um, I'm also wearing this thing on my back. It's a little heavy. Um, <laughs> I started, I started being interested in um, education as a, as a fifth grade teacher. Well, actually, even before that, but these are my fifth grade students um, to whom I taught my first science instruction. And I, I was Googling them this morning just to see where they are. They're like off in their careers and married with children now. It's kind of amazing. And now my students look more like this. Um, these are some of my, my current students and past students at the UK. Um, and I just, I just show you this just to say, you know, these are the people I have in mind when I'm doing the work that I do. Uh, it's the students past and present. And I think the forms of science that I've been doing um, have just changed in terms of focus over time. So here's what I'd like to do today. I'd like to talk first about just conceptually, what is self-efficacy and where does it come from? Um, and then I'd like to talk about the context of self-efficacy in uh, STEM-related fields. I'm going to focus on engineering today, even though there are only two engineers in the audience. Or if anybody else would like to sell all oh, three, this is good. Um, so I'll focus on engineering, but this is just one context in which self-efficacy and its uh, sources might be studied, so you can apply it to your own. And then I'll take it down to um, adolescence and share with you a little bit of the work I've done with younger people. And then at the end, I'll just, I'll just kind of wrap up with some contextual considerations of the study of self-efficacy. So let's start here with self-efficacy. And it's, by the way, this is a real picture of my students. This is not, this, this looks like a catalog picture, you know? This is like an impromptu picture of my lab having a meeting outside. We just happen to have our uh, somebody taking a picture of us that day. It was a real moment. <laughs> um, yeah, it's kind of neat. This is what guides my work. The idea that our beliefs are rules for action. Um, this is at the heart of what it means to be a psychologist, I guess, is that we believe that uh, what's happening in the minds of students guides what they do. So we can think about how this looks in the mind of a real student. Think about how this guides action. <coughs> and at the heart of the beliefs that I like to investigate uh, 
lies the question, can I do this? Can I do this? Where this could be any number of things. This is Albert Bandura, if you didn't know. Um, he wrote that, the, that people's level of motivation, their affective states, and their actions are based more on what they believe than on what is objectively true. I was just talking to Jen Schmidt's lab earlier about this very concept, the idea that you may have an objective set of skills, but what you end up doing and how you end up feeling might have more to do with what you believe about your, those skills than on what the skills actually are. So for that reason, we can't just be interested in, as science educators in just developing students' skills for doing science. We must also attend to the beliefs they hold about their capability to use those skills. So here's a teacher. How many of you are teachers or have been? Many, more than half. Think about the beliefs that you hold about teaching. Can I effectively teach these students? Can I understand the theory of relativity? Let's say if that's what you're teaching. Can I manage student misbehavior? Can I keep students motivated? We might call this a pedagogical self-efficacy belief or a science self-efficacy belief or even a classroom management self-efficacy. These will guide what the teacher does. We could put the spotlight on the student and we can ask the same questions that the student might be having um, as he goes through his day. Those of you who are graduate students, ask this question of yourselves all the time. Can I do this program? Can I do what this professor is asking of me? Can I graduate in this many years? These are all questions related to self-efficacy. So if we look at a Google search of self-efficacy over the years, this was when I was in graduate school. Um, 500,000 results, I mean, we really did this. And I just did this uh, last week and got 120 million results. So it might show you that, I mean, it could indicate a lot of things, but for one, it could indicate that um, there's been greater interest and more attention to the construct of self-efficacy in research and maybe even in the general um, public. Even though I don't think this is the name people out there really call it, maybe they call it something like confidence. Um, but this is, this is Professor Bandura's life work around the concept of self-efficacy. And so he's you know, written four books that have self-efficacy as a central component, the most recent of which takes a look at the ways of uh, moral, that people morally disengage, uh, although self-efficacy has a component there as well. Um, and plenty of others have written books related to self-efficacy in a variety of disciplines. Um, you see nursing here, you see sports. So there's been a lot of ink spilled on the topic. And this, I'm just going to briefly talk about social cognitive theory and where self-efficacy is situated within it. Um, it's here in the personal factors. And these are both influenced by the environment and by what you do, but they're also influencers of your environment and what you do. The beliefs that you have guide your behavior and your actions. So I'll just throw up some of the ideas, the constructs that my team measures within these areas. Um, Self-efficacy is the one I'll be talking about the most today, but it could certainly include many other personal factors that are uh, influential, many of which those of you in the audience study. Um, environmental factors, just a couple that we care about. And then outcomes. We care a lot about grades, a lot of people do, but there are other outcomes, like what do you choose to do in the future? What career will you go in? So self-efficacy is hypothesized to come from four primary sources. So, so I just wanna shift by saying, you know, self-efficacy has been well attended to as a good predictor of what people do. But there's been less attention over, over the last couple of decades about where it comes from and how we support it. And this is where it gets interesting to me because this is what teachers can do to help students feel more self-efficacious. The first uh, so hypothesized source of self-efficacy is your own experience. So what have you done in the past? I'm going to talk a lot more about these and give you a lot of examples, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here going through them. The second source is vicarious experience, watching someone else. So the observation, you don't have to directly experience something for it to change your self-efficacy. You could watch me um, 
fall down up here while I'm giving a talk and feel less confident that you could give a talk like this. <laughs> I won't fall down though, I hope. Uh, social persuasion, so what people tell you, um, you can do this, can change the amount of self-efficacy you have. And then the, f the last source is your emotional or physiological state that you interpret and go, ah, maybe, maybe I'm not so good at this, or yes, maybe I'm feeling really good about this, must mean that I can do it. So this brings us into the context, the first context that I want to share uh, my work in, and this is the area of, of college learning. And specifically, I'll start with engineering and then broaden out a little bit. Um, a few years ago, through a fortuitous encounter, my brother was building a house in South Carolina for someone and said, she's doing self-efficacy research, you should really talk to her. And I'm like, I doubt it. And he goes, no, really, she's an engineer. And I was like, self-efficacy, are you sure? Uh, turned out she was an engineer at Clemson who introduced me to another engineer at Clemson who um, I wrote a grant with. You know, like, that's how it happened. It, it wasn't uh, anything less fortuitous than that. So, um, yeah, and I just heard that uh, that person he built a house for was here on your campus last week, um, Julie Trenner, who's now at Ohio State. Yeah, she's an engineering educator. So, so. Um, with my collaboration with Clemson, we wrote a small grant to investigate these questions. How can we measure self-efficacy in engineering? There wasn't a lot of research on self-efficacy in engineering at the time. And then what experiences do engineering students have that changes their self-efficacy? So I'd focus mostly on middle school students until this, and this took me into the college realm. So a um, little bit about our sample, a uh, couple of universities, breakdown of engineering majors, and here's what we measured. So we measured a what we called a general engineering self-efficacy. I'm just gonna throw up some sample items here from the scales. But we also wondered, and I should give credit to the first author here who was my doctoral student at the time, who's got a background in chemical engineering. That was the other fortuitous piece. So she was doing ed psych, but she, her background was in chemical engineering. Um, so, we thought, okay, well, self-efficacy can be measured at different levels of specificity. So at the most general level, just can I do well in engineering? But then we could measure more specific skills and beliefs about your capabilities to use those skills. So part of our test was, if we get more granular with the measurement of self-efficacy, will it have different predictive uh, qualities? Will it be better able to predict? So we, we measured research skills self-efficacy, um, Tinkering skills, self-efficacy. Turns out engineers like to tinker. Um, and design skills, self-efficacy is sort of the three different skills specific. So there's a lot of scale development stuff going on in the background that I'm not gonna go into. And then we looked at three different outcomes. So GPA and core courses, this was all those required classes that engineers have to take, but including things outside of engineering, like math and you know different, different core then just their engineering specific grades, and then their intent to persist in the engineering discipline. So a different, different kind of outcome there. So I'll just show you the re regression results from this study. I'm, I'm trying to read the room, so if you start going, hmm, like I don't understand this, I can slow down, but regression okay? Okay. Regress. Regress, all right, I shall regress. Uh, so the three outcomes are at the top here. And we have a lot of predictors. The ones we cared about and were most interested in were these self-efficacies that I just shared with you. But we had some control variables and we were also looking at some other motivational variables like um, achievement goals and values. So when we looked at core GPA, this is the broadest GPA measure we had in the core courses. I just want to point out how the self-efficacy measures did. So the general self-efficacy measure worked well for predicting, positively predicting grades, and so did the design self-efficacy. But uh, that tinkering measure was negatively related to grades, which was a little puzzling to us. But uh, our explanation, or at least the engineering explanation was, maybe, maybe those who like to kind of play around with things and manipulate things aren't necessarily as focused on performing as well in their engineering um, related classes. They might really like that aspect, but not doing so well. When it came to predicting grades in engineering, only that general measure worked. And when it came to an, uh, intention to persist in engineering, and this has been uh, well established in the expectancy value uh, literature, it was the values aspect, that, not the self-efficacy, that predicted um, people's intention to persist. It's like, 
is this something intrinsically um, interesting and valuable to me? And on our survey, we had this question about just looking at experiences. We asked, um, how have you been exposed to engineering before? And so this led into the second kind of study that we're currently working on. 41% of the students we surveyed said they had a family member who was an engineer. That's a lot. 42% had already worked in an engineering facility before. 29% uh, said they had a friend, 26 had shadowed, about a fifth had done a co-op, um, and then only 17% said they had had no exposure to engineering. So it started making us think, you know, maybe the exposure to engineering is what's changing people's self-efficacy to do engineering in the first place. So why don't we focus on those four sources and see what we can learn there. So our, our next study focused on examining patterns in students' written responses to some open-ended questions, and then looking at whether there might be gendered patterns there, because there is, a, as you saw in the, just the sample of, that we had, quite a male-leaning um, population in the engineering field. And I'm sure that differs by engineering sub-discipline, right? Yeah. So here again is a, a look at who we were getting these open-ended responses from. And here are the questions that they were asked to answer. Anybody doing qualitative data analysis out there? Some of you, yeah. So these were on a survey and we quantitized them. That's actually like a word. Um, so I'll share with you that, but I'm also gonna share with you their responses to these, these four questions. These loosely map onto those four sources I was telling you about. The first question is vague. Just what events have changed your confidence and how? We left it open because we wanted to know if people thought of something that raised their confidence or lowered. We didn't tell them. The second one was, tell us about what raised it. Like, what made you feel more confident? So tell us about a time. So this was like looking for like what raised your self-efficacy. The third one got at the social aspects. Um, who's inspired you to be an engineer, encouraged you, and how and who, you know, who, who and how? And then the last one got at the feeling aspect, which I, f I think we're, we're the least developed as a, as a group on, I'm open to feedback on that. So let me take you through how, the, how those responses um, ended up. So here's the sample response from that first question. What events have affected your confidence? Co-op has greatly affected my confidence level in engineering. My co-op terms have given me real real wor world work experience and show me what a career in engineering would be like after graduation. I was able to apply my classroom knowledge to real world problems. So here we see this uh, very common um, experiential source of self-efficacy. Having done engineering before is at the heart of it. But here's one that shows kind of a mixed, a more mixed response. By the way, the codes are appearing under, the codes that we assign to that, uh, to that thing may or may not make sense to you, but that's what's appearing under. I typically do well on tests, normally above the class average, even if I'm not super happy with how well I did. This helps to boost my confidence, but I try not to let it go to my head. I also tend to be super competitive, and when people figure things out before me, it lowers my confidence. So we see some sort of social comparative process going on here. And so we did this, I just gave you the taste, but we basically had all these 700 or something responses to each of those questions. So as those of you doing qualitative research can attest, like this is a complex process of coding, you know, to get down to the themes. So I just, I didn't want to overlook the under the hood stuff that has to happen for the rest to appear. So now I'm going to quantitize those for you and then contextualize with some examples. So this is how it worked out. When we coded all the responses to that first question, most people were pointing to a direct experience with engineering. Um, and you might be wondering, but yeah, what kind of experience? So we subcoded that. So that's out here. So about half of those were something that happened in classes. So my making good grades and so forth. But other experiences were like co-ops and internships. Now these students were they ranged in their um, level of undergrad, so they weren't all able to do a co-op yet, so that could be why that's, that's showing up. 
But not all of it was that first source of self-efficacy. There were other things happening. Now let's look at this separated for men and women to see if the patterns stay the same. So as we go through these, I'll separate them so you can see how women responded. So pay attention to the direct experience and to the social sources. So for women, the social sources of engineering self-efficacy seem to be more prominent in their responses. When you just ask them an open-ended question, seems like more women than men, and significantly so, um, named some of these social aspects. We'll drill down further. So when we asked them how, we actually coded all their responses for did it raise their self-efficacy, did it lower it, or was it mixed? And here's how that broke out. So most people told us something that raised their confidence, but quite a few, and I don't think we would get this if we asked middle schoolers in the same way, uh, quite a few told us things that lowered their self-efficacy when just left up to them. Um, so that's kind of interesting. And then when we separate this by gender, we see that women had significantly more self-efficacy lowering things to tell us than men did. When just given a blank space to write what's changed your confidence and how. So that's a little concerning. So now let's look at the specific question about raising um, your self-efficacy. Again, the pattern was generally the same, so I won't break this down any further except to give you an example. Um, when I was told that one course was a weed out course for the first time, I truly believed it was a joke. The fact that I couldn't even comprehend that people had trouble with work, which made me fairly confident that I'm capable. <laughs> this is like a really confident uh, male uh, mechanical engineering student. Like, seriously, this is a weed out course? Yeah. So it's a social comparison that he's making. He's going, yeah, I, I mean, it's so not hard for me. Maybe this is not a typical case, but certainly a confident guy. So now let's look at these social sources where I think it gets kind of interesting. So the first, the first thing I want to show you is the kind of how and how we coded these social experiences. So when they referred to messages of praise or encouragement from others, we coded that as a social persuasion. But when it, when it referred to somebody who showed them a better way of doing something, I'm, I feel more confident because I watched him or her, we code it as a vicarious experience. So let's look at some examples. Social persuasion. After actually working for an engineer last summer, my boss gave me several words of, it, of encouragement and advice regarding my future in engineering, which was also very inspiring. And here's a vicarious experience. Yes, grandparent, uncle, and brother, all of whom are engineers. Remember, this is in response to the question, who's encouraged you? I'm inspired to do great things because of all that they have done. I know that I can. Can't underestimate like that 42% had somebody in their family who was an engineer. Kind of see the same thing in teaching. I think it'd be higher that. So um, here's, the, here, here's how the who broke down when we asked who did the encouraging. So if they told us who that person was, and we hope they did, um, this is who it tended to be. So yeah, most students are reporting feeling more confident because of what their parents said. Teachers play a role too. Now here's something interesting. We wondered if they told us a story about somebody who was gendered, like if they said, yeah, my mom. Well, we also had the respondent's gender. So we were able to ask, would there be a different pattern of responses if we ask women who talks, who's inspired them or encouraged them compared to when we asked men? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, on the left will be men who responded. How many of the men who responded to the question, how many named a female socializer? 16%. Are you ready? <laughs> so yeah, 30% of women. So here we see something that uh, Bandura has written uh, quite a bit about in terms of uh, social influence of perceived similar others. So if you see likeness, and you see some, somebody who's been encouraging to you, and they're similar to you, 
they might have, I mean, this suggests, they might have a greater influence on your beliefs about your capabilities than would seeing somebody who appears to be different. Not exclusively, but this does point to a pattern there, a gendered pattern. Lots of implications here for representation. Here's, here's the words of one woman. Um, I met and spoke with a woman who'd been a civil engineer and she told me that she thought I had the right skills and personality to succeed as a woman in engineering. This gave me confidence about engineering even before I knew that I wanted to be an engineer. I have a niece who's a sophomore at Clemson now. She's in mechanical engineering and she's just found such a woman who's like telling her things about being good at the same time she's having a lot of doubts and being in this male dominated field. Um, so it's really fun to see now like I didn't I didn't know, she was, she was much younger when I was doing this work initially. Um, so it's kind of interesting now to see it firsthand, how it plays out. So when we asked about feelings, this became really difficult to code. Thanks for the nods, because many of you do like emotions-based research. And so I don't really have a great, and maybe uh, Lisa, and with your wisdom and lab, you know, I, I could get some ideas about how we could code these better. For now, we roughly code them by, was it a positive, was it a negative, or is it mixed? <laughs> so this was one, one way of going about it. So just kind of a valence code. And so of all the feelings we got, there's actually quite a bit of mixed feelings about uh, doing engineering work. So I'll just show you some of these that um, are exem exemplars. So on the positive side, I typically feel creative, inspired, and ambitious. Um, I feel every part of my brain working on the next step while focusing on the present step. And many of the responses were like this kind of flow, kind of full engagement, and full use of my mental capacities. On the mixed side, though, I feel challenged and sometimes stressed. However, I always feel a great sense of accomplishment and pride whenever I finish an assignment or do something well. So there's kind of like a lot going on, which makes sense. Like, Doing schoolwork is complex. And then there's the sad case. Um, and you know, like still an engineering student? I don't know. Uh, terrible, demoralized, and incredibly anxious. A homework set rarely seems to establish the basics before delving into more complicated procedures. Sometimes I understand perfectly on a conceptual level, but there's so much monotonous number crunching that it still feels like a hopeless nightmare. I mean, this is like really a sad one. I think I had my graduate student pull out a, you know, sad case. So, but hey, this stress is real for some people. Um, so this, oh, and here's our, our breakdown by gender, which also shows a significant difference by gender. So more women than men express this mixed feeling of not sure, maybe not sure, or just having different emotional experiences. Uh, that, that could be to expressive, you know, could point to expressive differences. But isn't that a good, can you go back to the response of the mixed? So this um, mixed is very different than the negative thing. Yeah. Right, because sometimes feeling a little bit stressed, not too stressed, Yeah. but a little stressed yeah. is actually good to raise up to the challenge. Like if you, if you, if yeah. you felt no butterflies in your tummy, you probably, it wouldn't be a good thing. Right, right. sort of that so inverted that, you. So I just, so I don't necessarily see that as much as not like, there's no negative, I don't see anything negative in there. Right, maybe not. Yeah, maybe there's no reason for concern for the mixed feelings. It's just descriptive to say uh, it wasn't a full on positive thing or positive feeling that they express when given an option. They're expressing the complexity of their emotions while doing engineering work. And it's true, the, one of the, um, the most, I'm going to use it. The most challenging aspects of this was the word challenge. Because a lot of people just throw that out. At, How do you feel? I feel challenged. And it's like, is that bad? Is that good? When is it optimal? Because there is a point at which too much challenge and not enough competence. Right, right. Yeah. So definitely something we need to write about and make clear that just because emotions are mixed doesn't mean that they are um, bad or that we should be concerned. Yeah. 
<laughs> a little bit of stress is, is a good thing. That would be an interesting study just to do, you know, in itself, kind of a zoom in on, on emotions in the engineering setting to ask about, is stress a good thing? Sort of beliefs about stress, I think would be interesting. Yeah, I'm also feeling like if you characterized it based on balance and activation, mm -hmm. that, you, that would help you with these mix, mm -hmm. right? Because that, that stress is just high activation and can go positive or negative, yeah. right? Yeah, there's just so much ambiguity and in interpretation, so oh, much inferencing to do when you just have a person's like one-liner. You're like, I'm not sure what they meant by that. I have a feeling we're, we're going to end up with a lot of ambiguity in, the, yeah. in, our, in our findings, but that's probably what we need to do. Yeah, thanks for that. So overall, this study gave us a kind of re-emphasized the importance of authentic engineering experiences for supporting self-efficacy development. Co-ops almost never were co-ops listed as something that lowered self-efficacy. And I think that's an important, uh, important thing. Anytime that it's an experience, like hands-on, let's say, for lack of a better word, um, it was always associated with an increase in self-efficacy, or almost always. Um, academic, however, could lower self-efficacy. So problems in the classroom could keep somebody out of the field, but getting in the field is more likely to keep them there. So to me, early, ex or early meaningful experiences. Um, and then a couple other takeaways are that we did see gendered patterns that are probably worth further investigation, and that uh, there seems to be evidence of a competitive culture or a tendency among engineers to compare themselves to others as they're making their competence assessments. But along the road to engineering, um, how does self-efficacy get formed? And you know, some people have this kind of path and some people have that kind of path. Um, I've been involved in this really big first-year student survey um, that, you know, for, anyway, it's just a very big project going on at my university where we've collected data from entering students <coughs> and gotten involved with our institutional research to be a part of that. So, We've collected uh, three years of multi-wave data that after listening a little bit to Pat about your project with Lisa, you know, this gets complicated. This is not just engineering students, this is everyone. And it's resulted in like, you know, <laughs> have you ever tried to do this? I said, hey, somebody calculate how many cells of data we have to deal with because we've asked so many things over so many time points. It's a little bit overwhelming. But today I just want to focus on, on this 2017 year where we went into students um, intro English classes so we got a very large sample. It was 43% of the entering class and 90-something um, percent of the students enrolled in those classes. So we had a really good uh, sample and it was part of a larger study. But it's permitted us to examine how does self-efficacy change across the first year in college. Um, so my, with my student, uh, Jae Yoon Han, who's leading this, we've, uh, I've pulled out some kind of engineering relevant pieces of this because just to keep in the theme of the talk. Um, so we asked students these two broad self-efficacy measures. We decided to take an approach um, that I don't think has been really taken. Uh, there have been really broad measures, like how, you, how, how capable do you feel in your classes, but we separated it into kind of a quantitative self-efficacy measure and a humanities self-efficacy measure. So we asked how capable do you feel in quant classes, basically we labeled those as like your STEM classes, and then these are your humanities classes. Same four items to measure each of those. We just changed that word. And we gave them exactly these descriptors. On a big survey of first year students, you can't ask everything with all the nuance that you might want to, as those of you who do large scale studies know. So four items is quite a small, small measure. So first I want to just present the STEM students and compare them to the non-STEM students on the show you the main differences in self-efficacy because I think that's interesting, you know, is there a difference? Um, and then we'll break this out um, by engineering versus everybody else in STEM who's not engineering because we have students majors. We're really playing with the data at this point, it's, it's pretty new. So I'll show you the beginning of the first semester um, self-efficacy and then the end of the second semester self-efficacy for these students. And first we'll look at engineering um, students compared to all other majors at the university and quantitative self-efficacy is the outcome. So are you surprised 
to find that engineering students have higher quantitative self-efficacy than non-engineering students. Not really, yeah. Nothing much surprising there. When we compare engineering students to other STEM majors, they also have higher quantitative. I'm looking at the engineers going, yep, yep, yep. Um, yeah, I think my niece is in um, calculus four now. I'm like, they even go that high? <laughs> Who would do that? You know? uh, and then when we look at humanity self-efficacy, <clears throat> we see no difference between engineering students and other students. So maybe somewhat surprising, um, although I think a positive trend and pretty high confidence among students is a four-point scale. So we're using, I'm just showing this to you because I think it looks fancy and I don't fully understand the whole thing, but this is why um, we work with capable graduate students. <laughs> So uh, this, is a, this is a latent growth model of self-efficacy across the year. Just to ask the question, um, do these self-efficacy trajectories um, look significant? Are people going up or down in their self-efficacy in college? Like, do we kill self-efficacy when we bring students in? The good news is no. Um, yeah, I know. So uh, Self-efficacy in both of these domains increases across the first year of college. Now, of course, the logical follow-up is for whom, and um, these are the questions we're looking at now. But I'll just show you the gender difference. Um, when we look at this by gender, on the left, you'll see the quantitative self-efficacy change over time. And uh, solid lines are women, dotted lines are men. So women come in significantly lower than men in their quantitative self-efficacy, but the good news is they're catching up by the end, so no significant difference by the end of year one. Um, and then women had higher humanities self-efficacy than men. This is, I see some nods. This is sort of a consistent finding in the literature, at least in the areas like reading, um, but no difference in uh, change over time. Any questions about that? These are, you know, precursors to whether somebody even decides to be a STEM major. Um, so let me take it down to younger children uh, now. And I'll focus here on a study we did in Eastern Kentucky. This is a very interesting setting, rural Appalachia. Um, very high poverty. Everyone, everyone receives uh, meals at school. Um, a super unique setting that I had. I'm from Atlanta, so in an urban area, so um, not, a, not a setting I'd had a lot of experience with. It was because of a graduate student that we went there because of her connection. So we were interested in how math and science self-efficacy develop in middle school. And to do this, I just want to highlight some method stuff here. Um, well, that and, of course, the findings around this, this where does self-efficacy come from. But I think what's interesting about this study is that we used a mixed methods approach. And truly, I, I learned a lot about mixed methods research when I did this because it was for a special issue. And we got a lot of um, constructive criticism by the reviewers and the, the guest editors for how we could better mix the methods. And so I've come to understand that when you do mix methods, it's not just doing a quant piece and a qual piece. It's what together can they show. So I want to um, share with you some of those findings. So using a qualitative approach, same way that we did with the college students, we asked open-ended questions. What's made you feel more or less confident in math and science? We've got two domains. We've got multi-grade levels. We've got gender, interest in gender, and we've got a valence difference. So we've got a raising and a lowering. There's a lot to look at under that, and hundreds of responses, and multiple time points. A lot going on. Then we asked quantitatively those four sources of self-efficacy, and we asked about math and uh, science self-efficacy. So the coding categories look like this. We have some that represent those four sources. Um, we have some that represent classroom environment structures that were coming out in students' responses. Other internal things, like I'm just good at math naturally. And then the, the classic nothing that some children will write, like nothing changes my confidence, which the researcher must interpret as good, bad, I'm not sure. I'll show you an example of that. We used, this is just a screenshot from MaxQDA, which is what we use to code all the 
the, the open-ended responses. Does anybody use this software? One, two? Yeah, it can be helpful, but it's also a little complicated. So what I want to show you here is mixed again. So I pulled out a couple of special cases to show you. These are two high self-efficacy individuals that we surveyed. Um, high because their means are six out of six. <laughs> um, and so then I just pulled their answers to the open-ended questions. Now these were on different dates that they answered these things, but look at the consistency. At the top of this is what raises their self-efficacy. In red is math, in green is, or blue, science. On the bottom is what lowers their self-efficacy. Again, math, science. A lot going on here. See the nothing response? I'm just, go I'm just good at it. <laughs> what could change my self-efficacy for the worse? Maybe, maybe becoming an engineer in college. Yeah, I don't know. So here's a, a girl's response. Uh, when I answer a question, get it right, nobody else got it, you know. And then she really doesn't like to answer wrong, so she's really, uh, you know, social-facing judgments here. So let's take a look at a different case. So I just pulled math to make it easier to look at. This is, these are two students with low self-efficacy. What makes you more confident in math? Nothing. Math just makes me want to throw my freaking guts up. Uh, yeah, just being there, I know that it's very logical. When I see x plus y or something like that, my mind completely goes blank. Uh, and then this young woman is telling us about dyslexia, which has affected her confidence uh, to do math. Um, that would give me better faith, but sadly that isn't happening, and neither is me getting better at math. It looks like everyone involved just loses and has a bad time. Ah, I hate these stories. But, you know, these are representative of certain students' experiences. And what's interesting about mixing is you get a richer depiction of an individual's life. And, and the fact that we have these at different time points is kind of interesting because it, they're all pointing to the same thing. If we just looked at this quantitatively, it looks like this. I've done this a lot. I've published work that looks just like this. This is an SEM, right? Four sources predicting self-efficacy. And I would conclude that mastery experience positively affects self-efficacy and physiological experience when we measure it like anxiety lowers self-efficacy. The end, we make implications for practitioners and we're done with our study. This is the quantitative approach. But quantitatively, we can actually separate sources of variance in self-efficacy. So this is just science. Here's what alone in these circles, each individual source of self-efficacy was able to explain but look at the overlapping areas. That what this means is we don't have isolated events of mastery experience alone. Often, mastery experience comes with some sort, sort of social evaluation or persuasion, too. Like grades, you know, they're a, social, they're a social message from your teacher, basically. So there's a lot of overlap. And the qualitative data show this. So let me blow your mind with one that is at the intersection of them all. Try to code this. When I get a 100 in science, it makes me happy. And when we get in groups, it helps me. And when she works problems out on the board, it helps me a lot. But not that much, but it still helps me. <laughs> and when people say I'm very good in science, it makes me happy when I get help from a student. <laughs> so <laughs> there's, there's a lot going on in there. You know, there's emotion. There's there's getting help, uh, there's like, the availability of help, there's uh, the grades. So it's a complex picture of understanding the sources of self-efficacy. And I think when we use any one method, we might miss something. So a few years ago, a colleague and I, I know a lot of you are using uh, latent uh, or person-centered approaches to try to understand these more complex interworkings of the variables we look at. And here's one such study, just a snapshot of it. We actually said, how do these four sources then intermingle and create, or what profiles would emerge from these four sources of self-efficacy? And we came up, uh, my colleague Jason Chen and I came up with four. Um, a multi-source profile where people were good on uh, basically having high levels on all but the anxiety one and having low on that. Well, let me show you. 
So the multi-source one's purple. We would say, this is good. They're getting a lot of mastery. They've got exposure to models. People are telling them they're good. Follow purple now. And they have low anxiety. But we look at red, who we called the at-risk group, and this is a problem. So these are people who aren't having great experiences and are having higher um, negative arousal or negative feelings. So I just show you this to say methodologically there are other ways to account for the ways that these sources might work together or all at the same time. Um, okay, so let me close with some contextual considerations because I've kind of ignored context. And I don't want to do that because I think when we, when we ask how does self-efficacy develop we have these assumptions that it looks like this. I mean, this is sort of how the theory um, was originally made. These three sources always positively affect self-efficacy, and this one always uh, negatively affects it or negative affect. But th I, I just want us to think about if, if this is always the case. Um, so I've, Bandura wrote that, this is, a, this is typical Bandura right here, universality is not incompatible with manifest cultural plurality. Isn't that great? <laughs> when you read that as a graduate student, so you're like, what? Or as anybody, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, right, anybody, right, it's just complex. Um, by this, he was trying to address the question, is social cognitive theory and this theory about self-efficacy development universal? Can it be applied um, to any context and work the same way in any context? And he's like, well, actually, it can be both. It can be both, it can be both culturally sensitive and universal. That's what I think he's getting at here, that being a universal theory that in general works doesn't mean that it, it doesn't manifest itself differently in different cultural environments. So there's cultural plurality. Um, so maybe we could put question marks on these paths and say, yes, these four sources would probably crop up to some extent, no matter what the cultural setting we were looking at. Like I just showed you the setting of Appalachia. We saw evidence of these sources. But the way in which they affect self-efficacy might differ. It might depend on the cultural situatedness in which they arise. What is the relationship between me and my teacher? My teacher might take on a more importance in a certain setting. Um, her persuasions might affect me in different ways in this context. So these are questions that I think still have to be um, more carefully investigated or, and always at least considered by researchers who are doing this research. I think vicarious experience is particularly interesting and um, I'm gonna give a talk at the self conference that's coming up in you're going to be there. Some of you are going to be there in uh, Quebec City this summer about the role of social models. Because the weird thing is sometimes you see someone else do something well and it lowers your sense of your own efficacy. You go, oh gosh, I saw that. I, I don't think I can do that. But sometimes seeing a model do something well raises your self-efficacy. So what are the conditions under which watching someone else might make you feel less confident? By the way, I think in our field, it would be really fun, this is the me search idea, um, to, com to just make some mock uh, CVs and have your graduate <laughs> students look at them like, oh, we picked some other CVs from other graduate students like at the University of Kentucky. And I put, you know, 10 publications on there and that she's in her second year and she has these 10 publications. Anyway, you know, what would it do, right? If you could, you could create that and see what the effect of, but there's gotta be an indiv individual difference there. For some people, that would be really motivating, like, oh, wow, if she could do that, then I can too. And others would go, I'm just going to do, go do something else. I'm going to take up a different job. But I wonder, what are those processes? And so some of those um, have to do with our own social locations. So just consider a student. And I'll just take you through some characteristics that probably affect how she is taking in information as it happens. We don't just blanket taking the same information in the same way. So just consider these intersectional identities. So does each layer change her answer to the question, can I do this? Does it change what she's paying attention to when she's trying to figure out whether she can do it? And then 
if we put on top of this a learning context that has its own features in relation to her. Like, is this learning context predominantly white? Is she in a remedial math class? Or has she been labeled as is her giftedness not being you know, recognized? This is the social of social cognitive theory. It's the reason that there's an environment interacting with personal factors that influence uh, behaviors and beliefs. So maybe it's something more like this, some sort of integrated model um, where our personal influence includes things like our identity, our self schema, our values, our beliefs and our goals. And our environmental cues um, also change how we make sense of what happens to us. These things are like deeply contextual and I don't know that we've done a great job in the field yet addressing these contextual considerations. All of that gets weighed and is mediated by a mind who is taking, who is making sense of the situated uh, or the situation as she or he is going, can I do this? So this is kind of the latest model I'm trying to think about is just thinking more about what are these mediating mechanisms. So moving forward in my work and in self-efficacy research, I think it's really interesting to consider what, how might we intervene to change people's self-efficacy? What might those interventions look like? How would we roll them out? We were talking earlier about um, measuring interventions to change teachers' self-efficacy. Um, some of the work that I think uh, Jen Schmidt's team is doing is really focused on, maybe not explicitly, or is having the effect of changing teachers' self-efficacy for using motivational strategies. Um, so interventions. Uh, I think are a promising way ahead. Paying attention to that question of what raises and what lowers is interesting to me. I think I've started to chip away at that, but it's complex. And then I, I think I see promise in using mixed methods to get at some of these psychological phenomena, the way that these mixing these methods can bring in insights from the voices of participants, but also using the method, the quantitative methods that I think have been the long championed by educational psychologists. Here's my, recent, my current research team. We just took this picture the other day and I just want to acknowledge my three graduate students who all of whom were uh, featured in this talk and I think first authors on a lot of this work. Um, Kayla Yin and Jay Yoon and I hope you get a chance to meet them one day, especially to those of you graduate students out there. I hope you'll reach out to them. So thank you so much for your time. By the way, my shirt says, you can do it. It's my self-efficacy short shirt. Uh, yeah, the, it's inverted, isn't it? Yeah. So um, I know that Dr. Gray's class might have to duck out, but um, in, in which case, thanks for, again, for being here. But I'm happy to have a conversation. So I always get confused on how vicarious experience yeah. It helped me become more self, myself become, right? I can imagine that I'm an experienced person and I have certain skills and I watch someone who I don't think very highly of and I see him do it and I, and I say, I can do it. But in general, it seems like a weak predictor. Of it does. Does it to you? Yeah. So That's interesting. It seems uh, vicarious experience. If I want to, I keep thinking to myself, if I really want to help someone feel they can do it, then I have to put them in a situation where they actually do it. Yeah. Right? Rather than watching someone else do it. Well, the data support you, I oh, think. Okay. Well, you listed it one of your major criteria, vicarious experience. It's, so it's one of those hypothesized sources of self-efficacy, but the data, at least the quantitative data, would say, and the qualitative as well, not that it's a weak predictor, but that most of the time for most people, the most memorable thing that shifts their self-efficacy is having some related ex successful experience. I think that could be a generalization I can live with. What I can't live with is saying modeling is a weak predictor of self-efficacy because I think f for those for whom it is, I think. And I, I, I actually think some people pay a lot of attention. I mean, why do shows like The Biggest Loser? You know The, show, the Biggest Loser? Do you know that show? Okay, so reality show about weight loss. You know, you see people going through the struggle. Why do we, why do we watch movies like Rudy or, 
Why are we drawn to the compelling stories of others? I think because it shows us something that we too could be capable of. I, th I think there's something like Harry Potter. I mean, like how much identification is there with Hermione or with Ron or you know whatever that kids find themselves in literature and go, oh yeah, well, if she can do that, we'll not turn back time, although I'm try still trying, but if she can do that, then maybe I can do it. But I believe that there are on the whole, if teachers are gonna go with one strategy, it's skill building. Yes, it's baby successes. Yes. But I still think we can't ignore the, the fact that not seeing someone like you in a field can really undermine your belief about whether you could be capable in this area. I, I think it takes an extraordinary amount of tenacity to kind of go after something when you don't see others doing it. I think it also depends on when we think about social factors, what's at risk for not succeeding, playing in there as well. Yeah. So for example, um, I'll I use myself, um, meeting Sharon Griffin, who I don't know if anybody knows Sharon, the only black woman in MSU's math department when I met her when I was an undergrad, and she's been there forever, and she's the only black woman um, so seeing Sharon there and seeing what Sharon has done definitely helped um, with my own self-efficacy in terms of me being able to do it, but also the other end, the risk of what could happen if I failed at doing mm. it as well. So mm. it's like those two things come, like there's so, there was something at risk for me failing not to succeed. Yeah. Um, that was greater than maybe some of my um, classmates as well. And so those two together yeah. um, made my curious experience different for me, for me than the others. Um, That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that aspect of fear of not succeeding and, and the role of a model in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I get identity, right? So trying to build your own identity and stuff like that. So, it's, so that makes sense to me. Yeah. But watching someone else do something <laughs> doesn't teach me how to do it. It doesn't show me how to do it. It doesn't give me confidence, right? So seeing someone else this who's is and saying, they did it, I can do it. That's a little bit different because that's building, I can do it, but, or my identity. <laughs> not necessarily. Yet, you think it's I, building identity, but not I can do it. You know, well, it's showing me that people like me can do it or people who come from my background can do it or. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a little bit different to me than actually helping me have the confidence that I can actually do that task. Mm -hmm. Is it easier to think about it in the reverse, in the negative sense, where it, about if you see someone who failed miserably at something, does that lower your belief that you could do it? I had this experience as a graduate student. I, a couple of weeks before I defended my dissertation, I went to watch someone else's defense. <laughs> everybody, everybody in here is like, ah. Uh. And I almost went into full anxiety attack right, thinking no. about whether I could do this. And I feel like that's a really concrete example of how this vicarious experience affected Is alive. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah. If it's easier for you to think about it in that way than in the yeah. sense. And it makes me think of like, well, on the, on the positive sen sense, just how much people watch instructional videos. Now, there is a difference between vicarious learning and vicarious experience as a source of self-efficacy. Um, so I, th I think maybe that's what we're dancing around, that, that for you, you learn by doing and having your own successes. Although, you know, like I could learn how to play the guitar better by watching somebody play on YouTube and be like, oh, okay, that's how you hold your hands. That's more like learning. That's learning, that's an instructional move. But I think it can also be a self-efficacy kind of building experience by watching someone succeed at something in a, online, you know, through a, a video or whatever. Both could be happening. Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's easier to see when you think about a more behavioral action. So, like my six-year-old son, he's learning to ski, <laughs> and I thought I was being the best mom. I'm like, I'm going to sign you up for a private lesson. You're going to get all this individualized attention. And he's like, Mom, can I do the group lesson? And there was something about like seeing those other kids that were also figuring it out at the same time, gave him the confidence he needed to actually like stay up and be able to do it. They, like yeah. they were about at his level. They were his age. He wasn't looking at his instructor who could, you know, just do nothing. I mean, do everything. Yeah, do everything. So the, so, so like that, 
you know, incrementally better? Yeah, so, you know, Bandura has written about, and Dale Schunk and others have written about um, coping models versus mastery models. You know, you watch somebody cope through something, it can have an even more powerful effect than watching someone do something really well. Um, you watch them kind of struggle and go through. Like, I, I find that really helpful for just watching someone who's a year ahead of you in your program or, or two years ahead, you know, you go, oh, okay, I see how that's going to go, and I, I, you're still hanging in there. Sure, yeah. Yep. Young, uh, physics teacher when I was in China. So I uh, sometimes I look at some successful teachers' history or experience or mm -hmm. their teaching or something. I just feel very motivated in that process. But I, I, I'm not sure whether I, it, it actually increased my self efficacy. Mm -hmm. It really motivated me to mm -hmm. like pursue higher goal in my career. So yeah, so you raise kind of the point of what is the difference between motivation and self-efficacy? Um, my, my typical response to that is motivation, well, the metaphor I use in my classes when I'm teaching about motivation is that motivation is like love. It's one of these, con these, these constructs, ideas that is very hard to pinpoint. Tell me what it, I want to love, tell me what I should do. Mm, what's it? What's in love? Uh, well, there's physical closeness, but there's also affective closeness. If we start to break down love, it's going to get complicated. And what it means to be loving. Could being harsh be loving? Maybe. Uh, could that show your love? Yeah, maybe. So it gets complicated. So the motivation is kind of the same thing. It's sort of like an arch, structurally. It's super strong, but it's really made up of its component stones. Itself, we can't really talk about. We could just say it is, and it's important. Um, love is important, so is motivation. But to s begin to study it, we must look at its component parts, one of which might be self-efficacy for the motivation idea. But there are others, like you said. Like, you know, There's goals, and there's uh, values, and there's interests, and there's, there's other aspects of motivation. So this is just maybe but one component why is self-efficacy considered a component of motivation? Well, from Bandura's standpoint, um, unless you believe that you can do something, you have little incentive to act. So if you don't believe you can do it, why kind of attempt it? Now, there are exceptions to that. But on average, if we seriously doubt we could do something, we're probably not going to take the step to do it. Skiing is my go-to because I really have low, low, low skiing self-efficacy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could just, it makes my palms sweat just to think about it. Um, yeah, I mean, I always think about that. But uh, yeah, so I don't have a lot of incentive to go to skiing areas. Cause, you know, I just, I don't have high self-efficacy. It's going to go well. <laughs> don't think it's a good idea to put those on your feet and hope everything's going to go well. Um, so I, to that extent, did that help? I mean, I think self-efficacy becomes kind of incentivizing when we, when we have this belief that we can do it. Maybe so. Yeah. But I do think your motivation could change, uh -huh. but not necessarily because of your self-efficacy changing. Yeah. But because of other stones in the arch that are changing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I, uh, I happened to be talking to a friend. Um, I'm a chemistry TA here, and mm. I was talking to a friend who teaches a theater class at a junior college. And so what we were kind of talking about is like the outward projections of self-efficacy oh. with our students. And what was really interesting to me here was that you found that like when, you know, we're letting them write it down, you know, we're looking at it, they're not talking this out loud, they're not saying it in front of someone. <laughs> the science students are really underconfident compared to people that are in the humanities on that other side, mm. right? You saw that they were doing that. However, she said that she has to have these conversations with her students and like elicit this like self-efficacy from them to say like, you know, I need to know who is good at painting. Like it's not the time to be humble and say, I am not good at painting. Hmm. I need someone to paint this set who has the skills to paint. Like she can't get them to be like project this outward confidence in their skills because hmm. that would like 
you know, then they're, you know, big headed and this and that. And that's not something that's desired in the theater versus I feel like I have lots of students who are very self-confident in chemistry. I am the one that is going to be in charge of the project. This is the way the project is going to go. And this is what we are going to do today. Thank you very much, team. So like, you have to kind of like take that down and change that. So it's interesting to me, the outward projections that we see versus yeah. like these are a little bit more inward to me at least. Yeah, that is interesting. And you're pointing to some of those contextual considerations about how, and the fact that the, so, the social facing reporting versus the on paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so um, one interesting thing that I thought of when you were talking about this experiences of like how like people's K-12 experiences in STEM might be. Because like, yeah. for example, like where I came from, like they're now like having kindergartners like starting to do like STEM related things like once a week versus like some schools, they might just offer it during high school. So like that might like influence whether or not like kids like feel confident and like how often, how early they get exposed to it, like might influence. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you should study that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could do it retrospectively, I guess, and have college students tell you what were their exposures prior to college. Um, we did a little bit of that, but really roughly. But it'd be interesting to talk to people and say, at what point, like if you became an engineering major, what kind of experiences did you have before that? Because it's, it's unclear how those K-12 experiences shape decisions and your beliefs in college and later, especially if they were bad, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. It's and a what of the uh, self efficacy components are to us as educators are we should put the most emphasis on at different developmental stages. I feel like I should be writing these down to like think about in something f that I write in the future because I think that's a great question that maybe I haven't thought enough about. Um, I do know that younger children when you ask them to report their self-efficacy, they tend to have the extraordinarily high self-efficacy for just about anything you ask them. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, right, in spite, despite the fact that you're like, no, you really can't go out and fly right now. Um, because, you know, developmentally, it takes a while to develop the skills to evaluate what's required for something, metacognitively to know I probably don't know that. Um, or so, so there's this maybe poor calibration period. That said, I don't believe a seven-year-old doesn't have self-doubt. I think seven-year-olds do have self-doubt um, and question whether they can do something. The problem is on the research side, how do we get at that? How do we get, how do we, how do we find that and then so I haven't touched seven-year-olds in my research <laughs> for this reason, because I don't know how. You're not very good at surveys. Yeah, yeah that, like survey methods just don't work, right? So I don't know. I welcome your idea. At one point, I was talking to a second grade teacher about how to do it. And she said, maybe you should break down the question in ways that like some researchers have done before, like Sue Harder, where you ask a two-part question, can you do this, um, yes, no, and then how sure are you? Yeah, sort of, it's just a, just a question, can you do this, yes, no? Or, I think I can, I think I can't. And then after that, you said you think you can. How sure are you that you think you can? Really sure, kinda sure. And then maybe you approximate, I don't know, I haven't tried this, so somebody go out and try it. Has anybody tried it? Well, they do, Has it the does it work? do that all the time in the class, because yeah. they're always doing these like thumbs up, thumbs up. Yeah. thumbs down, and like middle thumb, and like how many of you think you're going to need my help? And uh, like, yeah. students are, they, it's very common. Yep, in interesting. To do oh, OK. That. So you could translate that into. Give me a thumbs up. How's your, yeah. <laughs> self advocacy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we need to operationalize that. Whether the so different sources of self-efficacy might be perceived differently by a younger child is another question that's interesting. Um, 
Like, is there a time at when I think, I think when it comes to the stages of learning something new to skiing, <laughs> paying close attention to models, not new to skiing. I'm looking at what I did last time on my last run. You know, maybe I'm looking at my own performance. Maybe it's that it depends on the stage at which that particular task is being learned as to what we pay attention to. Again, I think there's individual difference where some people are like, I don't, I'll give you an example from my current uh, learning management software, which is Canvas. I know you guys don't use Canvas here, but that's what we use at Kentucky. You use D2L. D2L. <laughs> <laughs> I see that you love it. Oh, yeah. So in Canvas, and I don't know if D2L has this, students, apparently the instructor can set um, uh, make a setting available so that students see the class average on any given assignment and where they stand. It's a little arrow to you are here and everyone else is here. Well, I didn't know this. Well, this is actually important information to one's self-efficacy in certain cases for those for whom it is. Some people don't even look at it. They don't care. They're not attending to how they're doing relative to others. It's just like, that's not what I'm here for. Um, I just want to see how I did. But other students, apparently I disabled it and it created a great amount of distress because people no longer could judge themselves relative to their peers. So I think at certain times of learning and for certain individuals, relative ability comparisons are salient. Um, and probably there are things teachers can do to minimize that, not just disable it, but to <laughs> refocus them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever the understanding piece is. <laughs> Yeah, that. But that's a great question. It would be really interesting to explore that. Yeah. Yeah, they were they were as young as fourth graders. Oh, fourth graders. Yeah. Yeah. Can be related with this. But from the perspective of quantitative researcher, um, there are very strong stability in self efficacy variables. So, T1 self efficacy and T2 self efficacy, they are highly correlated with each other compared to other motivational variables. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to hear you say that they're stable. I mean, I, I guess um, I don't know that I would could generalize that about the stability that the the three year study that I sh or the three time point study of first year students shows us a line. I don't know what the the correlations are between those me measures of self efficacy. I would imagine it's pretty high, but not identical, you know, like something's changing. And then we know from like work that Jackie Eccles has done and others that there is a decline in ability concepts over time. So that indicates not stable or moving in the moment or across a lesson or something like that. I don't know. No, no idea what that like, please do use the methods. Teach me. Um, how would you do these micro me measures of self-efficacy over time? And what would that show across a unit? Or that could be really interesting, as well as sources during that time. And, and looking at expertise. So again, like not having any familiarity with something. Like I have a student who's really interested in, uh, well, she's been working with a robotics camp. Um, and in robotics, that's a whole different kind of task, isn't it? I mean, it's not high stakes. It's at a camp. There's high failure rates when you're building robots to do things. So she's really interested in beliefs about failure and their effects on self-efficacy in this context. Um, so that too would take a whole different, maybe, maybe a different trajectory or change over time. So this means we're in business for a long time because there's all these questions. <laughs> Isn't it great, all these questions that could lead to <laughs> like, 
Eight. Are be like yeah, right. <laughs> we can triple that. Yeah. But it is. I mean, self-efficacy is contextual, but it's also, as I tried to mention, can be measured at different levels of granularity, down to like how confident are you that you can add two-digit by two-digit numbers, or yeah, um, or broadly, how confident are you in math? Um, and those are going to have different trajectories right. uh, according to instruction. They're going to have different st like stabilities. They're going to have different probably sources mm -hmm. at different times. Right. And they're going to have different outcomes that they're related to. Mm -hmm. This too is why we will be in business for a long time because yeah. you can measure these things in different ways. Yeah. I was interested that you had increases in self-efficacy over the first year. That's great, isn't it? I am surprised by that too. Yeah, so do you know why sense. that happened? You think it makes sense? Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I, 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 you're nervous going in when you're in engineering, you go through these awful things in engineering, and you go in there and you actually do okay. So your self efficacy increases. I think it's usually the other way though. People yeah. think they're going to set the world on fire, yeah. and they often don't, and, and yeah. therefore their self efficacy. Now, the, the, the plots I showed you were not just engineering students, but that'd be interesting to, to pull out. Or, no, I didn't. Did I, it, it was so the the lines were just all students for quantitative and humanities self-efficacy over time. But the bar pl the column plots show those were just means for um, yeah that's right that that's right they were beginning of the year and end of the year yeah that's true and they did show kind of an increase didn't they? Yeah. Although it wasn't as rigorous a test, but yeah. Because ours go down in the same time period. I'm pretty sure I've got to go back and know yeah. it, but we have a survey that's like the first week before classes start, uh -huh. and then we survey them in the spring, mm. and then and they go down across time, but they go down. I, I think we have to look at that more carefully because what, what you saw in those two bars were just two means from not necessarily paired samples. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I think we have to make sure that the same that we're comparing Apple's scores to ap their apples later at the end of the year, you know what I mean? Yeah, because yeah, we had survey attrition, so we had people who were in the second mean who probably had higher self-efficacy because they were answering our survey after all. They were probably right. doing okay. Right. Yeah, I saw another hand. Yeah. So that's what I was wondering because um, it looks like in the first part of the semester, or the, that first time, Thanks there were so much. more students than the second Yeah, point, yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. so that's yeah, you're wise to pick up on that. So that, that picture was just a snapshot of the people who we had answers for. Okay. The longitudinal, the growth, the growth model takes into account the same people, though. So what that shows us is, although it was a weak increase, overall, for the first year students in our study, quantitative self-efficacy increases, and so does humanities self-efficacy. That's good, but we have not yet broken that out by, in a more rigorous way, by major, and I think that would be... I, w I want to see now, I'm really, like, that's going to be, like, the thing I tell Jayun to, to do next is, like, because she's really, she's running all this stuff for us. Do you have enough data to break it out by subdiscipline? I don't think so. I, you know, even, I just, when, as you were asking that, I was thinking to myself, do we have enough data to just break it up by engineering? Um, because I think our end toward the end of the year, and this was just first year students, was 100 something, and I, I'm not sure we, like, I don't think that's, enough um yeah and definitely not by the sub-disciplines within engineering because there are traditional engineering disciplines where you have large numbers of women larger numbers yeah of yeah many like bio right just be interesting to see how that tracks with self-education yeah Uh-huh. And, and maybe that happened. Yeah, and maybe that happened. It's very possible. I was just going to ask a question about your um, choice to look at gender difference and wondering if, I'm new to self-efficacy, wondering if um, there is much work done in, in racial or ethnic differences mm -hmm. in There has been. Um, the choice to look at gender in the context of engineering was just due to representation there. Um, 
there has been uh, some work done looking at racial differences in self-efficacy development, or, or in especially like just mean differences in self-efficacy reported. On the whole, that research indicates that African-American students report higher self-efficacy than white students do. Um, that doesn't always uh, seem to... Re a lot of this work's been done in math. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, self-efficacy gets um, less attention in humanities disciplines, yeah. honestly. Um, but uh, some scholars like Sandra Graham have said, maybe we don't need to be doing these sorts of mean comparisons so much. We need to be just, let's focus on a group of African-American students and look at how their self-efficacy develops and, mm -hmm. and just focus on you know, one group rather than doing these, these comparisons, which can lead us to problematic conclusions. Yeah. Um, but thanks for asking. And I think more, I definitely think more research needs to be done in this area. Yeah. Well, we should stop now. Okay. Thank you so, thank much. You so much. Thank you all for this great question. Thanks. And, uh, has a little gift oh, for wow. You. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> a social persuasion. That's right. You got it afterwards. So yeah. It's non-contingent. It's a non-contingent reward. <laughs> thanks. Great talk.